Welcome back. Welcome to those who weren't here. I'm Julie Rubin. I'm really excited to introduce panel number two. And so will our panelists come on stage, please? Okay, our first panelist is Reynolds or Rennie Hahamovich, who's a recent graduate of history and Jewish studies and master's student from the Central European University in Budapest. He specializes in the history of Jewish radicalization, of Jewish radicalism, I'm sorry, Eastern European Jewish migration to the United States, the Yiddish language, literature, and publishing, and working class culture. His work on Yiddish anarchism has led him to the history of urban utopianism, science fiction, and social engineering in the 20th century. Hahamovich currently teaches it uh, about Yiddish anarchism among other historical Jewish topics at a high school in Budapest and conducts research at the Visegrad as a Visegrad fellow at the Open Society Archivum or Archivum. Ready? Thanks so much. Um, so it's a magical touch to get this right, I think. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to, to all the organizers um, and to Julie, of course. I, I just want a uh, shameless plug before we begin is that I am a product of three Yiddish programs, the Tel Aviv, uh, Vilna, and Yivo, and I would like to recommend them all to you, to anyone who's interested in Yiddish, whether you are uh, maybe an older Jew rediscovering uh, Yiddish roots or a younger Jew interested in Yiddish for the first time or not Jewish at all and interested in the history of Yiddish, the history of even uh, the Jewish left. Uh, it's a great opportunity. There's lots of funding as well that you can apply for, particularly if you're Eastern European. YIVO offers a wonderful grant, which they gave to me because I live in Hungary and they did not check the form very carefully to see where I was actually from. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and also the Center for Jewish History offers many grants for young researchers, which you should avail yourself of if you are studying Jewish history. There's not very many grants available for MA students. We tend to be you know, outside of the realm of the PhD grants and undergrad grants, but the Center for Jewish History has a lot. The American Jewish, uh, AJHS, thank you, yes. Uh, they gave me a wonderful grant, which is, it became this research project, so you should definitely um, look into these things. Uh, I also just like to thank the Evo the archivists who do uh, an incredible amount of work here. Uh, it's a massive archive. Um, just to tell a, a quick anecdote about the archive, uh, Yivo, or the Center for Jewish History Archive, I should say, is a little different than most archives. At most archives, there's you know, somewhat elderly archivists who run the front desk who you know, have this incredible knowledge of every single page in the archive, and then there's the young, robust archivists who have to run around and get everything. And at Yivo, it's the reverse. Um, <laughs> and so sometimes you feel bad that you're uh, asking uh, people to run and grab, uh, you know, 30 boxes and then you send them back the next day. Um, and when I first got to Evo, it was, it was my, really my first research uh, experience as a historian and I uh, went to go find some, from some anarchist documents which had maybe been touched once in 100 years and I was told by the archivist that um, uh, they can't find them uh, so you should wait a few days because the archivist doesn't want to hurt his back looking for them. Um, <laughs> So I just want to say I'm sorry for all the burdens I put you through, and I'm glad that this stuff is, is finally seeing more and more light. Okay. So that's the end of the joyful stuff. Uh, April 24th, 1903, the Forverts. Rivers of Jewish blood flow in Kishinev, the capital of the Russian province of Bessarabia, where the Jewish quarter has been attacked by Christians. The pogrom is broken to Jewish homes, slashing and shooting, hacking off heads, and stomping their feet on weak women and small children. 25 Jews had been murdered in Kishinev, and 275 were seriously wounded. This was a, monument for the, a monumental event for the Jewish press, and also for the non-Jewish press as well. The New York Times reported that the scenes of horror attending this massacre are beyond description. Babes were literally torn to pieces by the frenzied and bloodthirsty mob. The local police made no attempt to check the reign of terror. At sunset, the streets were piled with corpses and wounded. Those who could make their escape fled in terror, and the city is now practically deserted of Jews. A survivor said that they snatched my one-year-old girl from my arms. One took it by the leg, another by the other, and tore it in twain. I begged them to kill me, 
Then they caught up my boy, eight years old, and chopped him to pieces. Um, so needless to say, this was not a good time to be a Jew in Russia. Uh, the late 19th and early 20th century was a period of enormous poverty and discontent across the Russian Empire, particularly for the country's massive Jewish population. Russia was highly economically unstable and only growing more oppressive under the Tsarist government, particularly since the assassination of the previous Tsar in 1881, I believe, um, and which they were rescinding many of the so-called enlightenment policies that had been promised earlier, like the establishment of a parliament, the establishment of what we would now call civil rights. Um, so it was seen to be going in the reverse direction of most European countries. Inter-ethnic tension was stoked by nationalism and economic competition, most of all in the emperor, uh, empire's periphery, like Kishinev, where the majority of Russian Jews lived. The first pogroms had broken out in the 1880s. The pogrom is not a medieval word, like we often assume. It is, in fact, a modern word. But these pogroms in the 1880s were relatively small. They were somewhat like lynchings of blacks going on in the US at the same time, where it was usually only a couple individuals targeted and maybe a few other people beaten up, or maybe a few stores robbed on the way. Uh, they weren't full-scale riots. Kishinev was. It was the beginning of a tradition of mass collective violence against Jewish communities as a whole, where the majority or a very large part of the majority community attacks the entire Jewish community. And conditions for Jews in uh, that area of Russia only grew worse after Kishinev. Survivors of the program uh, reported, there is distress and poverty in the whole land such as was, was never before known. Wealthy men have become poor. Poor men are now beggars, and those who are beggars are starving to death. Reports stated that Jews in Warsaw had armed themselves with revolvers and stationed guards in the streets. In Romania, one correspondent claimed that the Christians of many towns proclaim openly that they will massacre all the Jews, and that the soldiers had said that they would help the pillaging once it starts. In short, the Kisinev pogrom threw Russian Jews into a state of crisis. There were since the Khominsky massacres almost 250 years before, and Jewish Paper was, uh, Jewish papers everywhere reported on the rising sense of dread. That is, except the Yiddish anarchists. This is how the Freya Abrishtima, the main Yiddish uh, anarchist paper, which I will abbreviate as the Fash, as it was, ironically. Um, uh, this is how it f reported on the pogrom two weeks after it happened for the first time in a small column in the back pages. Quote, it is a little too early to say for sure what really occurred in this unfortunate city of Kishinev because all the telegrams still coming now are very sparse in words. And as one can see in the many columns all across the Jewish daily papers, there is much to thank for the artistry of these fine writers who only try to add some color to the reports but end up concocting many details according to their own opinions. Though undoubtedly it was a terrifying massacre. Here, the Fash accuses the Jewish press of sensationalizing the pogrom, and then after adds that the massacre was terrible, but not because it had been of Jews, but that because it symbolized the, quote, wild, barbaric time which we now live in, where men can be so cruel. Saul Yanofsky, the editor of the Fash at that time, refused to privilege reports of anti-Jewish violence over any other type of violence. He pointed out that 9,000 Christians had just been slaughtered in Bosnia, but not a word of it made it into the Jewish press. He also criticized the demonstrations organized by Jews to get the American government to intervene in Russia, Theodore Roosevelt at that time. Let's not be foolish. The American government cannot act against the barbarism of the Russian government because its hands are also not free of blood. Um, one letter to the editor, this was a common um, trope in, in Yiddish papers at that time, agreed with Yanofsky, uh, calling the Vorwärts, the major Yiddish socialist paper, uh, a jingoistic troop of Jewish demagogues who were taking advantage of Jews and exaggerating their misfortune to sell papers. This was ultimately Yanofsky's conclusion on Kishinev. The Jews suffer in Russia, but so do many others. Indeed, maybe the beasts who committed the pogroms are really the greatest sufferers. For in their desperation, they were incensed by their demon oppressors who drew out the terrible beasts from within them. The Jews should learn to defend themselves, to fight like one who lives between two tigers. In the opinion of Yanofsky and many other Yiddish anarchists, the only thing that would ultimately save the Jews and the end Tsarist rule of Russia was a true social and political revolution. While another Jewish paper might claim that the pogroms, might blame the pogroms on the savagery of Christian peasants, Yiddish anarchists saw Jews and peasants as two halves of an oppressed working class cast against each other by the true enemy, the Tsar. This was a classical internationalist attitude. I'll explain what that means in a minute. The Far Abedistema essentially claimed that anti-Semitism, no matter how severe, was second to the oppression of the working class and could only be solved through class struggle. This dismissive attitude towards the Kishinev program encapsulates much of what made Yiddish anarchism unique among Jewish movements of that time. Um, to echo what was said about the Yiddish anarchist movement uh, earlier and, and to elaborate more, uh, at this point, the Yiddish anarchist movement identified broadly as an internationalist movement and rejected Jewish labels. So this before it had endorsed Yiddishkeit, so it was working in Yiddish, but it refused to see that it was building Yiddish culture or building a Jewish culture. This was true of most anarchists. Um, and they saw the use of Yiddish as pragmatic, 
Uh, a good example would be the Hebrew Labor Federation, which was a, a short-lived union that was a prototype for many other Jewish unions in the 19th century, which said that um, they held signs at their conferences that said, we are not Jews, we are Yiddish-speaking socialists. Um, and they also said that the reason we use Yiddish is to dissolve it. The internationalist hope, um, generally speaking, was that all ethnicities um, are just the source of nationalism, that they would eventually fade and that we would just be one beautiful anarchist radical people. Um, other Jewish leftists had previously maintained a similar view, uh, but most had moved away from it in the previous decades. People like Abraham Kahan, the editor of the Socialist Four Verts, had found that a more moderate stance that embraced certain aspects of Jewish culture and the idea of Jews as a people was a much more effective means of radicalization. And if the popularity of the Four Verts is any evidence, he was right. But the anarchists were the most internationalist of any of the many factions of radical Jewish movements at that time, and thus far had refused to make that change. They criticized papers like the Vorwerts as chauvinistic. Chauvinistic being a somewhat Marxist word, meaning bordering on nationalism. Uh, but this is the crux of this paper here. Scholars of Yiddish anarchism tend to talk about, um, this is scholars before Kenyon basically, tend to talk about uh, Yiddish anarchism uh, as perpetually in this internationalist mode, in part because its most famous members, like Emma Goldman and Alex Berkman, never swayed away from it. Um, Emma Goldman refused to identify as a Jew, basically ever. She would, but she would um, use many other identities. She often identified as German, Russian, um, uh, American, international. The only time she really regularly identified as Jewish is when she was being arrested because she would pretend to be an old Jewish woman. Um, <laughs> But if we parse the Yiddish anarchist movement into smaller pieces and focused on its main forum, the Freya Abrestimme, which I would say is the closest thing to mainstream Yiddish anarchism, we'd see that shortly after Kishinev, this internationalist line started to be questioned and fought over. The real turning point was the 1905 Russian Revolution, the first real socialist revolution and a major failure, which are hundreds of horrific pogroms um, break out across the Pale of Settlement. That is the areas where Jews basically lived in Russia. That immense anti-Semitic violence was a watershed moment for the Yiddish anarchists, convincing many that the problems facing the Jewish working class were in fact unique, and that only a radicalism that could articulate itself as a specifically Jewish radicalism could hope to save it. Um, so the Kishinev program happens in 1903. Shortly afterwards, Russia enters um, the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, which is a, a miserable decision. It uh, loses horribly to Japan, which has rapidly modernized uh, in a very small amount of time, and it throws Russia into enormous economic um, poverty and basically moves all of the troops to the wrong side of the country. They were all in the Far East, or most of them anyways, and then the West started to break out. There were workers' revolts, and then at a workers' protest in St. Petersburg, the police fired on the protesters, killing something like 130 protesters, uh, sparking what we now call the Revolution of 1905, which is, uh, in most respects, the first socialist revolution in the world, though it fails. Um, this was an incredibly important revolution uh, for Jews and for socialists because often, for instance, in America, many Jews, regardless of their politics, supported socialist causes in Russia because they considered this the only option to save the Jews uh, there. But, and by this point, um, the mainstream of the US had also sided against the Tsar as a sort of classical um, uh, uh, despotic empire. Yiddish anarchists were exuberant when the revolution began, but didn't consider it particularly relevant to the situation of Russian Jews at first. The overall feeling was that the success, the success of the revolution was inevitable, that the end of Tsardom was near, and that this would be a victory for all oppressed peoples in Russia. But as winter turned to spring, stories of horrific violence against Russian Jews seeped into, into the pages of the Fash. In one particularly panicked article published in mid-March entitled, Nikolai Mashuga, the writer claimed that for Tsar Nicholas, only one method remains to keep his power, to again provoke the oppressed elements of the people to make pogroms against the Jews. It is certain they will suffer much. In an almost pleading tone, the writer concluded, the revolution grows, it must grow, until it reaches its final goal, until Russia is liberated of its plague, the plague called Tsardism. Tsarism. The anarchist faith in the revolution was beginning to quiver in face of the growing anti-Jewish violence, which they had previously dismissed. Less than two months after the article, the Zhitomir program broke out. It was the first large uh, offense against the Jews by the Black Hundreds, an infamous right-wing group, and the first program where Jews resisted with violence. 29 Jews were murdered, and according to some observers, more Christians died than Jews. It was one of the bloodiest programs yet. Jews, it seemed, were learning to fight like they lived between two tigers, as Yanofsky had told them, but it was only making things worse. 
By the time of the Zhitomir pogrom, the Yiddish anarchist perspective on the situation of Russian Jews had begun to reverse itself. Anti-Jewish violence was no longer an unremarkable facet of class struggle in Russia, rather the pogroms made the revolution about anti-Jewish violence and about stopping it. One fash article proudly stated that the revolutionary spirit is stronger because of the Tsar's fortresses, prisons, and Cossack whips that perform his wonderful work. And the best thing for us, born of Jews, is the news that the Jewish workers play there such a mighty role in the struggle as leaders because of the terrible Kishinev pogrom. This is the greatest sign for us, that the Jewish workers make up the greatest portion of the revolutionaries, that they are the leading spirit of the revolutionary uprising. Such statements were a rejection of the internationalist attitude of earlier years. Now all criticism of Jewish chauvinism was gone, replaced by unabashed pride for the revolutionary character, supposed revolutionary character of Russia's Jews. The Kishinev pogrom is no longer presented as a minor sensationalized tragedy, but as the terrible bloodbath that marked the beginning of a genuine radical Jewish uprising. In the view of the fascist writers, Jews were no longer but one player in the revolution. Now the revolution was for the Jews, and the Jews had to be entirely for the revolution. By October, there had been 50-some pogroms since the beginning of the revolution in January. Just as the terror of the revolution seemed at its worst, hope came in the October Manifesto by the Tsar, which promised sweeping reforms, but shortly after, it was followed by sweeping pogroms. Between October 1905 and September 1906, there were approximately 650 pogroms in Russia, killing an estimated 3,000 Jews. The last major pogrom took place in the beginning of June in Bialystok. The violence there turned into a full battle, with Jewish self-degrims retaliating against the pogromists, leaving hundreds dead. The revolution continued on into 1917, but for most Jews, at least in America, um, the revolution had lost all hope. The sheer weight of the pogroms had ended it. The Fash aptly called this period the Sturmzeiten, the time of storms. In a lengthy article published a few days after the release of the October Manifesto, the Fash made its position clear that only an end to the anti-Jewish violence would be a successful end to the revolution. Take the Cossacks out of the street, for freedom is given by Cossacks as a mournful joke, and the fight for freedom will only continue. For here Nikolai has taken to, uh, to this old method, to drown the revolution in a sea of Jewish blood. Jewish women and children are cut into pieces. The Kishinev massacre is child's play compared to these current pogroms that the bestial Russian government provokes against the Jews. Freedom with the Nikolai, with the Trepov, with Cossacks, with whips, this is impossible. The incredible burden of anti-Jewish violence made the Tsar's manifesto an inadequate end to the revolution of the anarchists. The revolution's success for the Fash now only meant ensuring the safety of the Jews. The other goals of the revolution had been cast aside. It was a stance that could not have been taken only a few years earlier. The hardline internationalism that the paper had so emblemized was broken. The revolution of 1905 fizzled out. Many of its revolutionaries, fearing police retaliation, flee to the US and to other countries, starting a wave of Jewish nationalism and many new Jewish nationalist socialist movements, um, socialist nationalist movements, um, that form in other countries, and also in some places in Russia. Uh, I see this as the beginning of a new phase of Yiddish anarchist politics, in which many abandoned the staunch internationalism of earlier years in favor of an explicitly Jewish anarchism and a radical Jewish form of politics. It was also when much of the Yiddish anarchist movement began to retreat from inter international anarchist politics into the equally broad world of Jewish radicalism, becoming an intellectual force to be reckoned with among Jews to an extent it had not before. The Yiddish anarchists move away from internationalism towards a more explicitly Jewish politics may do much to explain their trajectory in later years. Scholars have noted that the Yiddish anarchists seem to retreat into the Jewish ghetto. Over time, although they forged many connections with Italians, Germans, Spanish anarchists, and others, the true international movement they planned on never arose. But rather than see this as a failure, we might see this retreat into the ghetto as Yiddish anarchists recognizing their struggle was not only with the powers of world that be, but specifically with the powers that ruled the Jewish street. I'll leave you with one event in particular to illustrate the switch in orientation. Toward the end of 1905, after most of the pogroms had run their course, thousands of Jews gathered in New York City to celebrate the 250th anniversary of Jewish life in America. It was a grand event with numerous celebrity speakers. Um, President Roosevelt, Roosevelt had a letter that was read, almost all of which, all the speakers, uh, drew a comparison between a despotic Russia, um, this was after most of the pogroms of the Russian Revolution, a despotic Russia of the Jewish past, and a, the, quote, beacon light of human liberty and freedom which is kept burning brightly by the United States the Jewish future. Jewish anarchism was denigrated alongside Russia as a symptom of the painful Jewish past to enthusiastic applause. The Fash explained the crowd's enthusiasm in that because simply none of our Jews, Eden, were there, only those Jews, Yehudim. No Jewish workers, only Jewish bloodsuckers. Drawing a new distinction between two different Jewish cultures, one working class, radical, and Yiddish, one bourgeois, reactionary, and Hebrew. There they were, the Fash claimed, the real Americans. Thank you. Thanks, Rennie.
Now we've got Tom, I'm sorry, Mark Gruder, who is from Simon Fraser University, where he received his PhD in 2018. His dissertation draws attention to the working class character of the historical anarchist movement through a study of the Union of Russian Workers, the URW, a North American-based anarchist federation and labor organization from the 1910s, composed of several thousand political exiles and peasant migrants from Tsarist Russia, who formed dozens of branches across the continent. Gruder was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Russian Far East in the early aughts, where he taught English at a university there. In 2005 and six, he worked in Vladivostok, Russia, as a journalist and English instructor at the Vladivostok State University. Mark holds a master's degree from the New School for Social Research in Manhattan. Mark. Okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone for, for inviting me um, to this event and um, just get started here. Um, as Rennie discussed, uh, as a result of pogroms and persecutions in Russia, many Russian Jews fled abroad. And those that went to the United States often joined the labor movement and became anarchists. So that's what I'm talking about. Thousands of Russian-speaking anarchist immigrants took part in a surging labor movement and strike wave that broke out across the United States in the 1910s. Russian anarchists worked as longshoremen in Manhattan, meat packers in Sioux City, construction workers in Chicago, <clears throat> shirt makers in Brooklyn, and weavers in Patterson. They took part in dozens of strikes, from New York City docks to brass and munitions factories in Connecticut, steel mills and coal mines around Pittsburgh, and shoe works workshops in Detroit, often in collaboration with <clears throat> unions such as the Industrial Workers of the World, the International Association of Machinists, and garment industry unions, in including the Jewish-led Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America and the International Ladies' Garment Workers Union. These immigrant workers from Russia were organized by a group called the Union of Russian Workers, an anarchist and labor organization, um, led in large part by Russian-speaking Jews and influenced by the Yiddish um, anarchist movement that preceded them. In the way that the German, anar the German anarchist movement laid the groundwork for the Yiddish movement, the Yiddish in turn laid the groundwork for the Russian movement, as Tom Goyne has discussed. The Union of Russian Workers, or URW for short, had dozens of branches across the country, located primarily in the Northeast and Midwest industrial areas. From 1911 to 1917, the URW published Golos Truda, in English, The Voice of Labor, a New York-based newspaper that focused on working class issues in the United States and served as a recruiting and organizing tool for the organization. Uh, I will talk about the lives of the Russian Jewish anarchists who helped organize the, the Union of Russian Workers, including some of their interactions with Leon Trotsky, while looking at some of the URW's activity in the United States. First, I want to talk about the context of the period briefly. In the early 20th century, labor and anarchist, excuse me, in the early 20th century, labor and socialist movements were on the rise, both internationally and, and in the United States. The Socialist Party was founded in 1901 and grew steadily into the 1910s. The Industrial Workers of the World, founded in 1905, sought to represent all workers in North America, organized across trades and eventually into one big union. Combining unionism with revolution, the, U, the IWW attracted popular support in the 1910s into the 1920s. These new mass left-wing movements, which included anarchist immigrants from many countries, reflected the emergence of broader progressive political forces in response to the excesses of late 19th century Gilded Age or robber baron capitalism, which had devastated working class families in the United States. In August 1915, for example, the U.S. government's Commission on Industrial Relations, which was created by Congress to investigate the causes of violent conflict between capital and labor, found that 20% of school-aged children in America suffered illnesses from chronic undernourishment. One-third of workers lived in conditions of half-starvation. The top 2% owned 60% of the country's wealth. During the very cold winter of 1914-1915, the unemployment rate was over 20% in many U.S. cities. 
The Union of Russian Workers branch in Baltimore reported that three-fourths of Russian immigrants in that city were unemployed that winter. As a result, unemployment demonstrations rose up in many cities, followed by record numbers of workers going on strike. In 1916, for example, 1.6 million workers took part in nearly 3,800 strikes, which was higher than any previous year of the first two decades of the century. The Union of Russian Workers made widespread and unacknowledged contributions to this insurgent labor movement, which grew in strength over the course of the decade. The URW had a dual purpose. The first was to participate in the American labor movement with a focus on improving material conditions for workers and radicalizing unions. The second was to train and educate Russian workers in preparation for the next revolution in Russia and to build up their organization as a means to support the anarchist movement in Russia. By recruiting a substantial following of Russian supporters in North America, the URW was able to raise thousands of dollars to build the movement in Russia, while the editors of Golos Truda in New York moved the newspaper to St. Petersburg in August 1917, and there began publishing daily an influential newspaper, Golos Truda. According to anarchist, uh, I'm sorry, according to Bolshevik turned, uh, anarchist turned Bolshevik Victor Serge, Golos Truda was an influential, widely distributed journal, which at one time competed with Pravda in the factories of Petrograd. The anarchists saw a rapid expansion of the ranks in 1917 and 1918, largely under the guidance, writes Kenyon Zimmer, of returned anarchists from, uh, from America. The most well-known anarchist member of the URW was Bolin. Bolin quit law school at St. Petersburg University in 1904 to devote himself fully to organizing workers. On January 9, 1905, Bolin was among those who marched on the Winter Palace to demand the establishment of a consti constitutional republic, but also higher wages and shorter hours at work. In what became known as Bloody Sunday, the Russian Tsar and his officers responded by firing on the crowd, killing and wounding several hundred, which marked the start of the 1905 revolution. Bolin then took on a leading role in the formation of the first Soviet in St. Petersburg later that year. Exiled to France for his revolutionary activity, he became an anarchist, and over the next several years, he continued to organize workers while writing for anarchist newspapers, including Golos Truda in New York. Hunted by the French police for his anti-war agitation in 1916, Bolin fled, by, fled the country by sneaking on the ocean line or Lafayette to New York. He had to work his way across the Atlantic, shoveling coal in the boiler room. And on the topic of ocean liners, transatlantic ocean liners, I recently came across an interesting fact about the Titanic uh, involving the URW. European-based Russian anarchist writers like Bolin would mail their articles to New York, which was carried on ships. In a memoir written by the anarchist A.A. Karelin, he says that six of his articles intended for Golos Truda were, quote, drowned together with the Titanic, Patanushi. Um, <clears throat> Bolin was arrested in the, uh, by the Red Army in 1921 for denouncing the Bolsheviks. Uh, looking back on this period in 1940, Bolin described a remarkable conversation he had with Leon Trotsky in New York in March 1917. Trotsky had moved to New York in early January 1917, expecting to lead the Russian socialist movement in the United States until the February Revolution broke out. At the printer's shop, where they both awaited their respective newspapers to come off the press, Bolin told Trotsky that he expected the Bolsheviks to take power in Russia and persecute the anarchists. You will begin to persecute us just as soon as your power has been consolidated, said Bolin, and you will end by having a shot down. Nonsense, replied Trotsky. It was nonsense to think Marxists would resolve their differences by turning their guns on the anarchists. What do you take us for, cried Trotsky. He tried to alleviate Bolin's concern by stating that Marxists were, quote, anarchists in the final analysis. The only thing is that you want to introduce your anarchism straight away without transition or preparation. Trotsky dismissed the distinction as, quote, a little question of methodology, quite secondary. <laughs> Two and a half years later, after Bolin was arrested by the Red Army, his captors asked Trotsky by telegram what should be done with the anarchist, and Trotsky wrote back, shoot out of hand. <laughs> However, Bolin was spared, uh, barely. Uh, the, 
the organization of a continent-wide federation that would become the Union of Russian Workers began to take shape when Golos Truda was launched in March 1911. One of the URW's most important founding members was Bill Shatov, um, who traveled the country organizing strikes while setting up URW branches, while also working with the, the industrial workers of the world. Pictured here on the left alongside the leader is, uh, is Bill, Shat I'm sorry, Bill Haywood, the leader of the IWW in the middle, and on the right is Bulgarian uh, wobbly leader George Andrechin. Um, for example, Shatov's uh, strike is one example of his, uh, what he did in the United States. In 1913, Shatov helped uh, organize an IWW-led strike of Russian, Polish, and Lithuanian workers at the Spreckles Sugar Refinery in Philadelphia. The success of this strike led to the formation of the IWW's local number eight of marine transport workers on the nearby Philadelphia docks which became one of the most powerful wobbly unions and the most ethnically diverse union in the country composed largely of African Americans and Eastern European immigrants. Shatov was also a point man for the Union of Russian Workers and the Garment Industry Unions, negotiating on, on behalf of Russian-speaking workers. Shatov's uncle, excuse me, during the 1905 Russian Revolution, Shatov fought in Jewish self-defense units around Kiev, and was arrested several times. Shatov's uncle had been killed in a pogrom near Kiev, and Tsar's persecution in general had, his, had reduced his family to beggary. He fled to the United States and began organizing for the Wobblies in 1909, converted to anarchism, and then helped start the URW over the next two years. Shatov often lectured at large rallies alongside people like Haywood and Emma Goldman, one somewhat critical correspondent wrote of Shatov, quote, delivering incendiary harangues in the noon hour, shouting through debates and halls, organizing strikes among the sweating foreigners, and collecting funds for the cause of the proletariat. Shatov commended himself to every mob because of his instant humor, his contagious emotion, and his genuine sympathy for the workers. Unlike his colleagues at Golos Truda, and most Russian anarchists in general, Shatov backed the Bolshevik state in 1918 while remaining an anarchist. He had impressed Trotsky and Lenin and was given several prominent positions, including being put in charge of the defense of Petrograd against an attack by white general Nikolai Yudenich. Later, he was put in charge of the project to build the Turkestan Siberian Railway and was featured in a few New York, uh, articles in the New York Times, such as this one from 1930. Despite his loyalty to the, to the Soviet state, Shatov was killed in Stalin's purges around uh, 1937. This picture might look familiar. Uh, the rest of the leadership of the Union of Russian Workers opposed the Bolsheviks, including Aaron and Fanya Baron. Aaron Baron had been exiled to Siberia after the 1905 revolution. <clears throat> and in 1912, he escaped to the United States and immediately joined the anarchist movement there in Chicago he met Fanya Greffinson, also an anarchist. Um, this photo of the Barons, um, was, which uh, Kenyon Zimmer showed earlier, was taken in Chicago sometime in the 1910s, and it was given to a, a colleague, colleague of ours, Malcolm Archibald at, at Black Cat Press, by a relative of Barons who, who currently lives in Montreal. Um, Aaron Barron was killed in Stalin's purges as well after spending years fighting against the regime in prison and in exile. Like other anarchists, Baron had criticized the Bolsheviks for creating a dictatorship over rather than of the proletariat, for usurping power, crushing worker strikes, and imprisoning or killing left-wing dissidents. <clears throat> it has been estimated that 90% of the anarchists who returned to Russia from America were killed by the Soviet gov government under either Lenin or Stalin. Fania Baron was shot by the Cheka in 1921. The Bolsheviks claimed Fania was involved in the bombing of the Moscow headquarters of the, of the Communist Party, which killed 12 members of the party committee. M Emma Goldman wrote of, quote, our dear splendid Fania, radiant with life and love. She had fought to the last breath. <clears throat> she resisted and had to be carried bodily to the place of execution by the Knights of the Communist State. Rebel to the last, Fania had pitted her her enabled strength against the monster for a moment and then was dragged into eternity as the hideous silence of the Cheka cellar 
was rent once more by her shrieks above the sudden pistol shots. I had reached the end, <clears throat> Golden continued. I could bear it no longer. In the dark, I groped my way to Sasha, and Alexander Berkman, to leave Russia by whatever means, only far away from the blood, the tears, and the stalking death. In addition to Fanya Baron, other Russian Jewish women of the, in the Union of Russian Workers included Rose Posada, mentioned earlier, who became a well-known labor leader of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union into the 1920s and 30s, as well as Dora Lipkin and Rose and Ethel Bernstein, who were rounded up during the infamous Palmer Raids of 1919 and deported to Russia alongside 250 other members of the Union of Russian Workers. There was also a Union of Women Workers, Sayuz Robotnitz, section within the URW that hosted meetings and lectures with Russian, Yiddish, and English speakers. The Women's Union rallied 300 Russian women in support of street demonstrations that spread across New York City in February and March 1917 to protest unaffordable prices on basic foods and clothing. Prices had gone up 82 uh, percent in the previous two years. Thousands of women from all boroughs took to the streets in desperation fighting against hunger and against the police who tried to shut them down. On February 24th, 100,000 women and children attended a hunger demonstration at Madison Square. <clears throat> Before the 1917 revolution turned their attention to Russia, URW organizers had been able to recruit thousands of workers in the United States through the organizing talent of its leaders, but also because of the terrible economic and social conditions experienced by workers in the United States, which helped radicalize many Russian immigrants and turn them into anarchists. Poor conditions for workers, together with high unemployment and extreme inequality, led to violent labor struggle, struggles across the United States. Picture is of the famous Bread and Roses uh, strike, where 30,000 immigrant textile workers struck in, Ma in Lawrence, Massachusetts, against hazardous working conditions and low wages. In the extremely cold winter of 1914 and 1915, the IWW organized a series of demonstrations of the unemployed with participation from Russian anarchists. For example, Aaron and Fanya Barron helped Lucy Parsons organize and lead a demonstration in Chicago that was violently broken up by the police. Lucy Parsons was a longtime anarchist activist and the widow of Albert Parsons, who was hung by the state of Illinois in 1887, as most people know. Thousands of unemployed workers gathered to hear speeches by Parsons and Aaron Barron, while Fanya Barron led a Russian choir in the singing of revolutionary songs. They had intended to march the streets of Chicago, but as soon as they went outside, mounted police started clubbing people indiscriminately, and Fania Barron was knocked unconscious while Parsons and 20 others were arrested and put in jail. In these conditions, many immigrants from Russia had found themselves broke, isolated, and living on the margins of society. As a response to these conditions, and as part of their broader labor and political organizing strategy, the Union of Russian Workers organized mutual aid societies modeled on Jewish relief organizations such as Arbiter Ring, the Workmen's Circle, discussed earlier also by Kenya, to provide food and shelter for the homeless and social settings for, for Russians to get together. In addition to forming their own groups, uh, the URW also joined and helped lead Russian divisions of the Workmen's Circle in several cities, including New York, Brownsville, uh, Chicago, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. The first Russian division of Arbiter Ring opened in New York in 1910 and was chaired by <clears throat> the Union of Russian Workers Brooklyn Secretary, and it remained active throughout the decade. The division was involved in raising money to attend to the medical needs of Russians, for example, raising funds for those sick with tuberculosis. By mid-1915, orders from uh, Europe for ammunition um, and supplies had started to revive the U.S. economy. In mid-1915, workers began striking in larger numbers across numerous industries, demanding their share of the profits. And by early 1916, capitalists were facing a large-scale rebellion among workers of all skills. Anarchists seized the moment, and members of the Union of Russian Workers organized in labor unions. I'll just end here quickly. Um, there's another strike. So, on, on this issue of anarchism and its relation to, to the labor movement, I think the Union of Russian Workers had some interesting ideas, and I just wanted to lay out and introduce a new character. Um, <clears throat> Golos Trudeau's editorial line on the issue of anarchism and labor was articulated by the newspaper's principal editor from 1914 
1917, Maxim Ryevsky, who wrote Anarchist Communists, Bakunin, Kropotkin, and others, based their theories on the experience of the labor movement and considered them valuable only insofar as the masses recognized in these theories the realization of their own hopes and aspirations. According to Ryevsky and other Golestrudo writers, the strength, if not legitimacy, of the anarchist movement rested on its ability to appeal to the masses, which in industrialized countries were located primarily in working class and labor movements. Ryevsky, the Baron, Shatov, Alin, Volin, the Raiva brothers, and others aimed to turn the Union of Russian Workers into a mass organization in the United States, not just an anarchist one. And this meant integration into the labor movement. They sought to unite the Russian left and wanted all Russian-speaking workers to join and to lead all Russian-speaking sections of labor unions in North America. They attracted a large following because of their responsiveness to the needs and deniers and desires of ordinary immigrants. I was going to give some more examples of strikes that they participated in, but I think we're out of time. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we've got Nina Garionova. And Nina teaches at the Department of Slavic Languages and Literature at Northwestern University. Her scholarship is in the fields of literature and art history, and it encompasses both Russian and European modernist and avant-garde movements, with a specific emphasis on the interrelation of aesthetics and politics. She has authored and edited six books on the Russian avant-garde and published extensively in Europe, the United States, and Russia. Nina has served as, as the primary exhibit or exhibition consult for the Museum of Modern Art in New York and participated in the organization of many exhibits. Her most recent book, The Aesthetics of Anarchy, won the A-A-T-S-E-E-L Book, best book in literature, <laughs> literary cultural studies annual award. And you can explain to us what that acronym is for. <laughs> Nina? Uh, Julie, thank you very much for such a lovely um, introduction. Lovely and lively. So let's, you know, a mystery of anagrams remains the mystery, so it will be a, 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 t, s. I can repeat that. Uh, from alpha to omega, right, praise. And let me not waste time because we don't have, actually we're not allowed much time, so let me just start. Um, interconnections between art, politics, aesthetics, and ethics are a long-standing feature of Russian civil society. And this is particularly true during the tumultuous era of Russian Revolution, especially the years of 1970 and 1918, when nothing yet was determined, when the Russian Communist Party, the Bolshevik, or majority in translation, faction of the Marxist Russian Social Democratic Party, that was the original name, Marxist Russian Social Democratic Party, which then was remained in the communist, struggled to size state power and wide with anarchists and other leftist parties to determine the course of future events. Unfortunately, we know that the future events were developing pretty tragically for other leftist parties, which were uh, respectively crushed uh, by uh, the Bolshevik uh, fraction um, in the next, in the following three or four years, actually. My previous work, um, you know, was examining the cultural politics of the Moscow newspaper, Anarchia, Anarchy in translation, again, not anarchism, anarchy, and the role of the avant-garde artist in this paper. But today I would like to look at the aspect um, which uh, was defined um, by one of the previous speakers as Yiddish cosmopolitanism and um, its role in the forming, actually, um, cultural scene uh, in um, around 1918 
and I would say for beyond. Paul Overage, whom I don't think I have to introduce in this uh, audience, does note that by March 1918, Moscow, where there had been fewer than 100 anarchists before 1917, because as uh, you know, the previous um, speaker, uh, Mark, uh, reported that after the revolution of 1905, 1907, which actually, you know, I would disagree, I wouldn't define it as truly socialist revolution, as written. I'd rather say that was probably anarchist uh, revolution because it was spontaneous. It came really as an initiative of students, of soldiers, of workers, and it uh, was multi-ethnic. Um, it was kind of like the organization and activism was happening while uh, the historical ones were developing. Therefore, uh, there was no kind of like real center uh, controlling it. And th that was, uh, I think, one of the amaz amazing, the most amazing historic events, which is not yet, uh, you know, uh, thoroughly researched. So after 1907, um, a lot of uh, participants, uh, be it, you know, Jewish or Russian or Latvian or Polish or anybody else, uh, you know, because there were multiple nationalities and ethnicities in the Russian Empire and uh, as many languages, had to uh, run, run a hide. Therefore, the scene uh, between 1907 and 1917 was pretty quiet in anarchist development in Russia because <laughs> it was very thoroughly banned because somehow anarchists were always linked to the most extreme radical acts of terrorism. Uh, you know, was it justified or not? I'm not here to say that, but uh, that was the attitude of power. Uh, and uh, practically, uh, you know, there was a Moscow organization of Moscow group of anarchist syndicalists, um, which was uh, acting uh, actually in the underground, uh, risking a lot of, uh, you know, their well-being, um, because they, if they discovered uh, they could be imprisoned. Nonetheless, still spreading information, and they managed to set up an un underground typography in Moscow. So when the February uh, revolution or putsch happened in 1917 in Moscow, and um, you know there was an abdication of mor monarchy, uh, therefore, uh, practically, uh, you know, it was this very free moment, but again, unfortunately, you know, um, in terms of historical chronology, it was just a moment of a uh, couple of months. Then anarchists could came back, they could uh, be legalized, and they start using this typography established by this underground uh, Moscow group of anarchist syndicalists, right, led by Hudali. And um, they regrouped into what they called uh, Moscow Federation of Anarchist Groups, uh, which actually counted in it, uh, you know, several, I mean, almost, almost close to 50 or more anarchist groups, from fractions of Bund to Tolstoy's Christian anarchists. And um, that became very powerful organization because it had to combine practically for the first time anarchists kind of like united because you know Spencer mentioned here that you know anarchists are radical they're radical towards themselves so it was for the first time that there was this incredible will for tolerance and understanding. And I think this will for to tolerance and understanding inspired the creation of uh, newspaper Anarchia. Uh, Moscow became a center of anarchist activity by then, by March 1918. And uh, anarchist communist organ, Burevesnik, 
the stormy petrol in translation. And it's actually, you know, from one of the Gorky's little stories taken uh, name, had taken, according to Paul Avrish, whom I said here, a back place to Anarchia, the daily newspaper of the Moscow Federation of Anarchist Groups. Uh, this um, newspaper was uh, published and edited by uh, many people, uh, starting from Apollon Karelin and ending with Gordon Brothers, who actually moved from Moscow from Petrograd, including um, German Askarov, uh, who uh, was uh, uh, very prominent, another very prominent um, Jewish anarchist uh, of, of the time. Um, the situation in Moscow was conducive to this development because before the suppression of the city's anarchist factions in early July 1918, the Moscow Federation of Anarchist Groups had become a substantive force in the political arena, unlike Russian anarchism, more fragmented Petrograd groups, uh, mostly centered uh, around um, communists. And in the words of Communist Party functionary, one of the Latvian riflemen, Jan Peters, Moscow's anarchists constituted, I quote uh, his interview from uh, newspaper Izvestia of 11, April 11, 1918, Moscow anarchists constituted a second political power and a threat to the communist regime. So what I think was so amazing in uh, the uh, newspaper um, Anarchia, and that's the aspects which I would like to uh, introduce uh, today, it's actually, um, first of all, the development from local, um, you know, small newspaper to truly national anarchist newspaper, practically number one, in 1918 in Russia. And second, a uh, newspaper published in Russian by the general editors who were speakers of both Yiddish and Russian, Abin Leiba Gordin, who signed their you know, periodicals and their front page essays, which they would write for every other issue in Russian, signed by Bratio Gordin and Brothers Gordin. And um, incredible ability, actually, to accumulate and to centralize around uh, this uh, newspapers all the different voices, uh, voices which would be respondent, for example, to very important trade union of railroad workers, because railroad was the ma main transportation back then and the main connection. So if you have railroads, you have you know, very important instrument to get uh, political power. Uh, and Kazimir Kovalevich, Polish by origin, was publishing there quite often. Um, apart from that, uh, you know, the editorial staff included uh, from September 13, when the first issue was published, till July 2nd, 1918, uh, with some interruptions due to government raids and temporary arrests of the editorial staff, uh, were run by Barmash, German Askarov, uh, whose real name was Igapsun, and the brothers Abba, Abba Ben Yehudalev, and Zayv Gordon, who even signed the editorials uh, together, as I mentioned before. The first nine issues came out weekly from September through uh, to early November of 1917, and after a break, the newspaper resumed in March um, 1918, as a daily with a new in large format. Today only two complete sets of the newspaper 99 issues <laughs> all together survive. Um, from the start, um, Anarchia actually responded to uh, the needs uh, of the workers, of the soldiers, and was striving also to build very, to build very significant audience among intelligentsia. And there was no particular emphasis on uh, you know, ethnicity or actually even social class. And in this regard, I think it was just brilliant decision by Gordon Brothers to expand, to branch away from uh, you know, group oriented towards uh, ethnic needs, uh, towards you know, particular population, 
into the whole you know, audience for the whole empire. And I think that's what propelled this newspaper towards a national newspaper without actually kind of like losing very important elements of, uh, if you wish, um, um, not particularly Jewishness in it, but interest and importance of Jewish contribution uh, to uh, the movement. First of all, it runs a lot of translations, translations from German, translations from Yiddish and from English of the most contemporary st uh, start. Um, second, um, it constantly would uh, bring up the issue of uh, anti-Semitism and fight against it. Um, the issue of uh, violence introduced by uh, Bolshevik government towards any fractions, and a uh, very important uh, issue of new market, which was emerging market for arts and for literature, and the way how artists should behave in this situation, um, as well as um, very um, important role of education. Education, not only children education, but also workers club and workers education group. Even more so, by 1918, the artists Kazimir Malevich, Alexander Rochenko, Vladimir Tatlin, and others who at the time called themselves anarcho-futurists, along with the poets Rurik Ivnev, the pseudonym of Mikhail Kovalev, Bayan Plamin, Vladimir Sidrov, also known as Vadim Bayan, Svitagor, and Alexei Gastev, who later actually was leading one of the major institutes in the uh, Soviet Union Institute of Labor, regularly published articles on art, literature, culture, and politics in the specially organized by Gordon's section called Creativity of anarchist newspaper. This creativity section was edited by Alexei Gunn, who uh, you know, is often looked upon as a father of Russian constructivism, and actually the person who authored the first uh, program and doctrine of constructivism, uh, the, the book called Constructivism, even before you know the practice developed, even before all this you know famous um, works we know by Rochenko, et etc., et cetera, who actually also participated very actively there in the newspaper. And um, what uh, was the most uh, important is that is for the first time ever avant-garde artists in Russia participated in political newspaper, and that was in anarchist newspaper, and participated not just, you know, submitting one or two essays, by leading their own section, and by uh, Rochenko submitted something like 50 essays, Malevich even more, uh, Gunn, I think, was a champion on that, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The headquarters of the Federation's newspaper were originally on Krimsky Wall, and soon moved to the former Merchant Club of uh, Moscow on Malay Dmitrovka Street, which was rechristened the House of Anarchy. Later, after the Bolsheviks laid siege to the House of Anarchy, the newspaper moved uh, to Nastasinsky Periolk, where the Poets Cafe, uh, with you know active triad of uh, Maikovsky, uh, Kamensky, and Burluk, who established their own little anarchist group, uh, which was not part of Anarchia, but rather did was fight by Anarchia. Um, so that's where uh, newspaper Anarchia. Uh, moved. Uh, while originally Anarchia uh, w was welcoming euphorically, actually, what they call proletarian social revolution and power seizure by the autonomous Soviets, which means in Russian, actually, the Soviet means in Russian a council or a board, because it's a very wrong translation for the past hundred years represented. Um, so it's a 
Council of Board of Workers and Soldiers Deputies. That's what means Soviet originally. The original concept of such Soviets directly corresponded to the anarchist political and structural models of autonomy and decentralization, which later was perverted and oppressed by the strict Bolshevik party regulations and centralized uh, control. So even so, originally they were welcoming the revolution, and here I will cite one of the Gordon's essays from a newspaper, um, English translation is mine. We should contrast the bourgeois chaos uh, based on the oppression and exploitation of one man by another with the free independent organization of equals, a new world of free world comrades, free workers in a free union of liberated commun communes. Revolution is the greatest joy, first of all, the universal celebration of the premonition of a new life. There should be no pogroms, no victims, and no bloodshed excesses except as a strictly necessary self-defense. And I think, you know, uh, this um, tolerance, uh, this kind of like multifaceted uh, nature of the newspaper, which united all these groups together under the leadership of two Yiddish anarchists, Brothers Gordon, Payback, and um, the uh, idea of creativity, became uh, the unifying idea here. Uh, this idea, since March 1918, allowed the volume and the structure of newspaper to change significantly. Instead of two, now there were four pages of much bigger format, and it ran serious and thorough overview of political news and events in Russia and abroad. Even more so, the ideological platform of the newspaper slightly shifted as well following the brisk changes in the political and historical reality, there was a strong feeling of disillusionment and more and more criticism towards Bolshevik dictatorial politics, especially Trotsky's policies of red terror and street uh, executions without trial or tribunal. Human life is devalued. One can be shot by accident following the accidental detainment, bitterly wrote Abba Gordon in his editorial on the nightly executions of anarchists in Moscow in April of uh, 1918. But the main goal was achieved because Renew Re 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 Daily succeeded in its attempts to engage new readership, especially among students and intelligentsia. The next step was to address the anarchist-spirited writers and artists in order to attract the like-minded new authorship. And I would like to say that considering Malevich's participation, and I did deep research on it and published on it, um, you know, many times, so I don't want to repeat myself here, but I think, uh, you know, the famous Vitebs commune of Yunovis, which mostly considered of young Jewish artists of this population who came to power by rejecting on one part shtetl, on another part, um, you know, any kind of like uh, dogmatic, statehood, um, this anarchist commune of Yunovis wouldn't be possible without the experience Malevich had in newspaper anarchy. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. That was really interesting. Uh, if we have a mic, we have a mic. We have a mic. If people would like to uh, ask questions and maybe direct them to one or all of the speakers. We have two mics. Look at that. Sir. Um, I'll try and be brief, but um, you mentioned when you were talking about the programs, you mentioned Jilstra. As uh, stated, uh, there was more of an example of resistance in towards the end. And I was just wondering, I've read like a little bit about the fact that the city was like predominantly Jewish um, at that time, that there was a strong anarchist movement there that was involved in um, a secessionist movement around the 1905 revolution. That was one of the reasons it was targeted. I was wondering, I can't find much info, so I was wondering if you know anything about that that example of like very Jewish anarchist real organizing that was happening there. Uh, so sure, that's a great question, and it, it leads into a uh, okay, the question was about uh, the Bielostok pogrom and that uh, Bielostok had a very large Jewish population and a significant Jewish anarchist 
uh, population, uh, which we don't know very much about, to be frank. Um, and there was lots of talk between the connection between Jewish anarchists in the US and Jewish anarchists in Russia uh, during this time, but the connections were very ephemeral. There weren't very sturdy connections. So we know, for instance, that people were sending back literature from the US where really the best publishing houses were, the best newspapers were, sending them to, to Russia where people were radicalizing quite quickly, not only anarchists but socialists um, as well and uh, of many different types. Um, and the anarchists are very interested in this and they're always reporting on it. In fact, all of the Jewish press is quite concerned about reports about Jewish anarchists in Bialystok and they were, of the hundreds of pogroms, um, there's maybe 20 or 30 that I've found that were blamed on anarchists that uh, basically the, you know, the, the police say after the pogrom, well, it's like, well, you know, uh, a Jewish anarchist shot someone, and so what could we do but shoot all of the Jews? I mean, there were no other options. Um, and so, but basically, the, the, from what I've seen, the anarchists in the US don't know anything more about it uh, than that. So um, I believe with Bialystok, there were uh, Jewish anarchists involved in the fighting. Um, there were uh, uh, self-defense groups um, that form not only with the Bund but with other groups of Zionist groups, Zionist-backed groups as well, that formed all over the, um, the Palestine element as a re reaction to the 1905 revolution, which um, then increased up until uh, up until 1917 and into the uh, the civil war period, which is wh where the most pogroms are. Um, and anarchists are a part of that. Uh, it's not clear to me exactly who's the institutional backing the most in 1905. It, 1905 is a really sporadic. Like it's not clear what's going on. As uh, was said before, it was quite chaotic. Um, so it's difficult to parse who is where. Yeah. Uh, the, the birth and the growth of the anarchist movement uh, was stimulated on one side, side by the social economic condition in, in a country, and on the other hand, by the system uh, willingness and tolerance to allow the, the ideas to grow and and evolve. So if you look in the exposition, we heard what happened in Russia and United States. Uh, what, what would you say that there was a more propitious uh, environment for evo uh, evolution and growth of anarchistic movement toward uh, positive results? I think in the is this on? I think in the United States in the 1910s, <clears throat> that was a more is this on? Yeah. it is on. Um, it was a more conducive environment for, for to build up the anarchist movement. In fact, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why so many Russian anarchists, Jewish anarchists, went to the United States because they could organize relatively freely uh, for a long time. They could publish newspapers. Um, it was relatively free compared to Russia, right? That, that ended sometime around 1916, or started to come to an end sometime around 1916 and 1917, when a Red Scare sort of you know, swept over the United States with, because of the war and the rise of the labor movement. So when the labor movement rose up in the mid-1910s, um, people in power got scared, capitalists got scared, and they started to crack down on radicals and, and workers and, and, and these anarchists who were trying to rally the workers in building, you know, building up these mass movements and these strikes. So certainly the United States was a lot freer um, during that period. Um, I'll say that uh, Paul Everich, who's a, the made, what we now deceased major historian of Russian uh, anarchism and, and American anarchism, um, has uh, great bits on sociologically what the difference is between people who are attracted to socialism and people who are attracted to anarchism uh, in Russia which uh, I think, to, to my knowledge, hasn't really been done you know, in the US. It's, it's still work that needs to be done about what attracted people to anarchism precisely over other movements. But he says that in Russia, um, Jews mostly worked in shops, so small, not a factory, but a, a sort of small area with maybe 10 to 20 people where your boss was usually your father-in-law or your uncle or some like a family friend, someone you knew really well who had taken you on as uh, something like an apprentice, the, the term is going out of use. Um, and, that, and then other Jews in cities like Bialystok worked in factories, which were just starting to come to Russia, where there would be maybe a sort of a Jewish-owned factory with um, 300, 400 workers in it. And that's a very different sociological space um, because you didn't know your boss. 
So uh, what the socialists would do uh, in the 1905 instance, mo most of them were nonviolent. Um, and so they were better in the shops because you didn't want to kill your father-in-law, usually. Um, <laughs> so uh, they, they would say, well, we can strike. We're going to have you know, mass rallies. We're going to embarrass you in front of your shop until you, you know, give us better workers' rights. Where the anarchists would just say, we'll come and threaten to kill your boss. And uh, for factory workers, that was great because they didn't necessarily have that sociological connection. So you see these pockets of anarchism grow and oftentimes in places where there is more urbanism uh, and more urban industrialism. In the US, uh, in some cases, it seems to be the opposite. It's not exactly clear where the line is, but it's interesting research to be done. I'll just add two words because, you know, in Russia, as well as, I guess, in general, in the world, there are three major, um, you know, tendencies in anarchism. It's anarchic communism, anarcho-syndicalism, and individual anarchism. So I would say that individual anarchism actually uh, was uh, taking over in the period between first and second Russian revolution, between 1907 and 17. Uh, because of many different reasons. One of them, of course, uh, you know, it was uh, not so directly involved with politics. And another, uh, it was rather, you know, um, philosophical approach to anarchy and anarchism. And I think that's uh, the difference in the Russian situation. And I don't mean Russian ethnically. I just, you know, the name use geopolitical name for the particular historical date, right, of 1907, 1917. Uh, there was much more affinity than anywhere except probably, you know, France in the end of 19th century, in the 1880s and 1890s, with arts and literature. And uh, I think that also, uh, you know, kind of like showed in uh, and was reflected in the creation of such a unique uh, periodical is uh, newspaper Anarchia. Thank you. Yeah, in 1898, a beloved president, William McKinley, was assassinated by a Polish anarchist, Szalgusz, and one would, say, well, it led to the age of Roosevelt, who was a strange person, so, I can see that there wouldn't be an immediate push against anarchists from someone of his mentality, but it, it certainly didn't bode well, I would think, for the anarchists' movement and for potential anarchist planning you know, in America. Or maybe just it was ignored and not thought of in that way. Uh, yeah, so um, McKinley is shot in 1901 by Leon Czolgosz, who's a... He's, um, uh, he's not an immigrant. His parents were, were Polish immigrants. Uh, he had been a, he was been a, basically an unemployed steel worker, uh, an anarchist. There was lots of debates. Still are debates about whether he was crazy or not. Um, there's a really great book actually I recommend uh, to any non-academic too called Murdering the Kindly, um, which is half about sort of anarchism and the history of psychological interests in immigrants and and the Progressive Era. But um, yeah, so. After 1901, there's big talks of which um, work of uh, instituting various laws to stop anarchists. One is becomes known as the Anarchist Exclusion Act, I believe in 1903, which um, forbids people from entering uh, the country who are anarchists. And it's it's one of uh, and there's another law that forbids uh, what's called criminal anarchy um, or the advocation of criminal anarchy. So you, Emma Goldman could no longer go and say take the bread because this is seen as a violent. Thing, but it was actually quite easy for anarchists to just change their language and to get around this law if they wanted to. Um, whether the police were actually enforcing it based on the reality of the law is, is another question. But then anarchists found that um, they could abuse these laws for their own gain if they want. So the Ellis Island, uh, not a police chief, but head says that in 30 years, they um, got maybe uh, 12 anarchists. I forget what the number is exactly, because you can just say you're not an anarchist when you come in, and that's what people do. And the, and the people who are caught are people who, it seems, intentionally get caught. So uh, Turner, John Turner, is an English anarchist who comes, who's brought to the US with the intention of being caught by the anarchist law, and then he's put in a cage in prison, and then all of these people, not only anarchists, but even people who work for the government, Liberals are saying this is a freedom of speech issue. 
this, uh, you know, these laws have to be overturned, and then this really leads to only to positive things in the anarchist movement. It's really propaganda in their favor. So uh, yes, many, many things do come out of this movement. They don't really affect anarchists, but they do affect even now how the US controls uh, basically political dissent, uh, particularly with people who um, are crossing borders. Uh, these, these acts are still cited today, so. Well, I, I think that um, to some extent, Berkman's attempted assassination of Henry Frick and then the incident with Chagas did kind of shake shake up the anarchist movement a bit, and I think that's why you saw an increasing turn toward uh, toward labor organizing as a, as a as a way to you know did this hurt did that did these incidents hurt the anarchist movement? Well, maybe to some extent, but I mean there was a, there was a conscious effort to to get involved in, in mass or organizing with the labor movement, um, and so um, you know it's still an open question. Um, just a quick note about. Uh, McKinley's assassination. He's, uh, Cholgash is widely um, disavowed by anarchists, uh, with the major exception of Emma Goldman, uh, who refuses to disavow him and says, you know, I believe that he is an anarchist, because most anarchists say he's not, um, and that I don't necessarily think what he was doing was right. Uh, McKinley wasn't that hated as far as presidents go, um, but, you know, it's still an anarchist action and we have to accept that, and so that causes a lot of rife within the movement and, and other reactions to the McKinley assassination. I don't know if that mic is working. Do you want to try it? I'll try it and I'll see. Hi. Um, no, why don't you come to this mic? Because we can hear. You can hear, but they can't hear. Hi. I have a question to Mark and to Nina. The question is about the pairing of politics and culture, but also about brotherhood. And the question will not be about the brothers Gordon, but about the Eichenbaum brothers. So, Wolin and Boris Eichenbaum, right? So, I was wondering whether. Um, there are studies of the relationship between to the two brothers, whether in your research into Golos Truda or the correspondence, something interesting came up. I know that Boris Ahimbaum did publish an article in Golos Truda, um, I think in the 1918 or 1919, uh, but I wonder if there's more. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, not to my knowledge, but um, there should be something in there archives, I just am not aware that anybody is working on it because, you know, Spencer said in his introductory word, uh, anarchism is still kind of like irritates idiots anywhere in academia and outside. And, you know, one of my distinguished tenured colleague was once, uh, you know, was saying like, oh yes, and this artist is definitely be going anarchist because he was getting up late and was late for, uh, for the meetings, you know. <laughs> what can you say? Uh -huh. it's, time, it's time to recognize that there is a special discipline which is called anarchist studies. And, you know, it would be great if somebody, you know, following generation would, would look into that because it brings the whole issue of formalism. But that's of why course, I'm asking. yes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Great question, thank you. Anybody else on that? Uh, I don't think that mic is working, so why doesn't... Oh, it's working. I, I don't think any of you referenced this directly, but back in Eastern Europe, there was a significant Jewish participation even in the leadership of the Machnavite uh, anarchists, but at the same time, that movement has a reputation for being anti-Semitic, and I don't know which, which is actually... I know that the Jews were involved, but was the the anti-Semitism from the top or just from Ukrainian peasants that were participating in it? I don't believe it was from the top. I mean, earlier historians that gave Makhno that reputation, a lot of Soviet historians gave Makhno that reputation. It was easier to discredit his movement if you paint him as an anti-Semite. I think the more recent research has suggested that, um, you know, that while there was some anti-Semitism in the lower ranks of the movement, in any sort of mass peasant movement, you're gonna find that. It did not come from the top down. Um, that, that's my impression, anyhow. Uh, actually, uh, you know, I know there are a, a lot of research, and especially right now by some of the U Ukrainian scholars. Um, my colleague, Johann Petrovsky Stern, was working a little bit on that with, uh, you know, some academics from Toronto. And uh, one thing which is, which is just like archivally proven is that, for example, you know, Makhno was protecting Jewish shtetl population, along with, uh, you know, peasants in uh, what was called back then Malarasha. And uh, actually, they funded him. 
They were giving him money to buy weapons in order to protect from both reds and whites. Uh, I mean, the question of Makhno is very interesting because I think he is just, it was demythologized uh, endlessly by Soviet government, by uh, monarchists, by, you know, Ukrainian nationalists, by everybody. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. This is maybe a much broader question than some of these others, so take it in whatever direction you will, but I just, as you were all talking, I kept reflecting on how now, like in the period you're describing, we find ourselves in, in a, a struggle to unite the left against powerful, consolidated right-wing forces, and that within that struggle, there's a lot of controversy and debate over the nature of anti-Semitism as opposed to other forms of oppression. And I'm just wondering if you think there are relevant lessons or kind of what similarities and differences between the two moments are, are politically useful to think about. In relation to anti-Semitism specifically? A, a, but also more broadly. Um, the, <laughs> this question of uh, division on the left is, is huge and it plagues basically any scholar of radicalism is being upset all the time about how the left failed in so many ways, right? This, this failure to unify, right? The, the history of the left is often a history of a tree that grows outward. Um, and, but I think we have to be careful, uh, historians would say you have to be careful about how you identify your sources and who they're actually talking about. Um, something that, uh, that shows up a lot in Kenyon's work and in my own work and others is about the distinction between anarchist leaders and anarchists, the sort of um, run-of-the-mill anarchists, uh, the average Joe anarchists, and that there's often a huge gulf of opinion between them. And it's very hard to see, so what did the average anarchist think about something because there's very few texts left. Um, we have what the intellectuals wrote, what the leaders wrote, uh, who lived totally different lives, often had very different backgrounds, many of whom had not been workers for a long time, right? Um, but often you see that there are huge fiery debates like Emma Goldman whipping Johann Most on stage. But it's not always clear that this necessarily trickles all the way down in every case. There's a famous anecdote about how um, Jews would go into the, uh, the Jewish anarchist movement, uh, uh, meetings and the, uh, the anarchists would claim, you know, down with socialism, anarchism is the only way. And then they would, you know, agree and they would take their free beer and they would cheer and then they would leave and then they would go to the socialist rally the next door <laughs> and they would say down with anarchism and they would say, yeah, and they would get their free beer, right? So it's, it's, it's a little hard to find where the boundary is, where the borders are, where the factionalism really struck. And maybe that's what we should look for, you know, and sort of both the problem of the left today being division and the problem of uh, is not being able to unite the working class behind the left anymore as it, as it had been earlier um, is, is seeking where those divides actually were. If I may, um, just to give you one, I think, incredibly smart and beautiful example of how uh, Brothers Gordon, I use a pseudonym uh, because they published under this name, right? Uh, did promote a fight with anti-Semitism to their mostly non-Jewish audience. I said, old monarchist Russia was full of pogroms. There were pogroms against students, against intelligentsia, and of course against Jews, the weak things of the world. The power, not the people, organized pogroms. The state used its police, its Cossacks, and sometimes its soldiers to do it. Nikolai is in Tobolsk. And who is in Kremlin now? They call it the dictatorship of the proletariat? No, gentlemen. This is a dictatorship of bureaucrats. This is the worst tyranny of all. For the authority, an end always justifies the means. Mark? No? Please. Um, I had two questions, and uh, I guess the first one is, um, personally, I'm really interested in the history of radicalism and revolutionary activism in the U.S. in smaller towns and smaller cities. So uh, I guess in that spirit, you know, what, uh, you know, if, it's, if we're talking about the union of, of uh, Russian workers or just Russian and Yiddish and Jewish anarchism generally, yeah. 
I mean, in smaller towns and smaller cities in, in the U.S., what did that activism and organization and culture look like a little more specifically? Uh, the second question is I'm curious what kinds of ties and connections uh, Russian and uh, Yiddish anarchists had outside of, you know, Europe and Russia and uh, the United States, say, you know, across uh, South America, Latin America, Mexico, and, you know, Asia, where there, where there are anarchist movements. If those connections existed, and if so, what, you know, what did that look like? Well, just to say a little bit more about the Union of Russian Workers and, and how it worked. Um, <clears throat> so it was a federation with something like 30, 40, 50 branches, and they had branches not only in New York and, and Pittsburgh, uh, big cities, but in small towns throughout the, the region as well. I mean, I don't know how this applies for today, but just, just to give you a little bit more of the background. So <clears throat> um, there was, they were always trying to respond to the needs of the local community. So there are URW branches all around in small towns, and, and in order to sort of um, coordinate the organizing, there would be speakers the, the headquarters was in New York, and they would send organizers and speakers out to these small towns, some of the more talented speakers to, to help with the organization, people who had experience, and to get the organization off the ground that way. Um, but it was basically, it was, a, you know, it was a labor and it was a social organization. So they would, even in small towns, they would provide, try to provide uh, resources for Russians, like you know, job information, basic, creating um, basic social spaces for people to come and listen to lectures. They had these uh, they call them Russian people's houses where people would come and sort of create a community and create a culture for Russians to come and participate in. So in order to get them involved in, in labor organizing and into anarchism, they welcomed all Russians and they wanted people to, um, you know, to, to attend their parties. They had parties all the time and they went to, um, you know, all these events where they'd take trips, cultural trips, and, um, and basically just trying to <clears throat> bring the Russian community together in the United States. That was a, that's what, you know one of the one of the most important functions that it has in terms of how that can translate today. I I, I don't know. Um, I would say in this question about small towns, it's it's a great question. Um, basically, when, when it comes to anarchism, these were immigrant movements, right? And so they were successful wherever immigrants were. And oftentimes we think of them usually in these ethnic enclaves in the cities, but there were lots of immigrants in the countryside, right? Uh, also sometimes in ethnic enclaves, but in towns. Um, Kenyon's book, Immigrants Against the State, is, is about Jews and about uh, Italians. The Jewish section is mostly about New York, uh, and the Italians is largely about Patterson, New Jersey, which of course is just across the river, uh, and is really great. And if you're interested in, uh, in that, I would follow that thread. Um, it is also something that, you know, the idea now that we have now that rural areas are generally more right-wing and, and urban areas are generally more left-wing is, is not that old of a distinction and right in say the 19th century people might have thought the opposite right that the sort of uh, liberal and conservative intellectuals who were opposing anarchism would have been in the uh, urban centers uh, and they were really desperately trying to keep anarchists out of the mines for instance because they knew that it's as soon as they enter that people are going to start to radicalize right so it seemed like the countryside was a basically a political place that was waiting to be politicized um, so it was a, a struggle in that way and you could say that it's the same in a certain way now um, and about your question about the sort of connections between Jewish anarchists and Russian anarchists around the world, there are connections all over the world. The, the biggest center outside of the U.S. is probably Buenos Aires, um, but there are connections really all over. Anywhere the Jews were, they formed Yiddish anarchist groups in South Africa, in, Isra in Israel, in Australia, and there were connections wherever basically those other immigrants went as well. Um, you would even see interesting connections, uh, say in California, between Jewish and Japanese. Um, anarchists, and I even found it's really depressing to look at the uh, like collections of Jewish anarchists from the 70s because it's like they, they have so little money they're writing on the back of sandwich receipts and stuff. Um, but there is a letter from a Japanese anarchist organization in like 1969 writing to the Freya Arbeitsstimme saying, um, we've never heard of you before, uh, what are you? And uh, they respond like, well, you know, we're this group, this is our long history, blah, blah, blah. We're so glad to hear that there are comrades in Japan. And actually, they had had contact before. It just neither group now remembered it. Um, so it's interesting to see how those connections fell apart over time. Let's take two more questions. Sir? Uh, hi. Uh, great presentation by all three of you. And uh, there's something you touched on, I think all of you touched on, even some of the 
uh, people on the previous panel touched on, which was the, the pogroms and the effect that that had on radical organizing. Uh, and I think this is really relevant today because I think that the Black Hundred and those movements are the real precursors of, of um, the alt-right, um, even more so in a way than the SA and so forth, that they, the pattern really started there. So my question is this, um, to what extent did the outbreak of the, the outbreak of the, the programs as a real phenomenon happening in, 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 in sort of in, in, in really large scale, uh, to what extent could that be said to have um, encouraged radicals to go more in the direction of socialism or the Bund, let's say, in the case of, of uh, Yiddish-speaking people, as opposed to anarchism? Did it, did it have an effect in terms of saying this is more, and more, if we want to combat this, this is a more effective way of organizing or a more effective ideology to take on than anarchism? Or is it maybe the other way around? I mean, who on the left, I mean, to, I know it's a bad word, benefited in terms of being able to organize because of these events? Uh, I would say that they both benefit, and they both benefited greatly. And you can see basically the, the history of modern Jewish political movements, uh, the birth of modern Jewish political movements uh, has a large part to do with the waves of pogroms. Uh, so in the 1880s, uh, there's major pogroms between 1881 and 1884, and it leads to basically the, the birth of um, uh, all modern Jewish political movements. Uh, political movements. Um, uh, but they're still relatively unpopular. Uh, and then in 1903, you see Kishina pogrom, and then there's another boom in Jewish political movements, and now they're starting to find ways to negotiate with working class Jews. Before, for instance, um, anarchists and socialists, uh, both in the US and Russia, were mostly um, operating in Russian because they were from assimilated petty bourgeois backgrounds and they didn't necessarily speak Yiddish. And they were really annoyed that basically Jewish workers wouldn't listen to them because there wasn't that much connection between them. Uh, and they were also kind of talking about the wrong things. And then after the pogroms, they start to switch into Yiddish. Uh, and then there's this explosive growth. And then after 1905, there's another growth. And then after uh, 1917. So it keeps really growing in response to violence. But I wouldn't say it's necessarily a push towards socialism or anarchism or even the left. It's a push towards nationalism. Um, not necessarily articulated as nationalism. It, it would be difficult to call the Bund a nationalist group. But in many ways, it, it's using nationalist language. It's using goals that are normally associated with nationalism. Um, and there's also, I, didn't, I had to cut this out of the lecture, but um, there, uh, after the Kishinev pogrom, a uh, certain uh, sect of theorists of the Yiddish anarchists in the U.S. Um, break off and they formulate what they call, what they call for uh, Yiddish uh, nationalist anarchism, uh, which beforehand would seem like a total contradiction. Uh, and then it, it never takes off, but it does start a newspaper, um, and it does actually, I think, really warp the Yiddish mainstream anarchist movement because it has to start responding to nationalism and start taking on nationalist tools, whether it wanted to or not. So, yeah. Nina, Mark? Uh, maybe, maybe just a, two words, because, you know, it sounds, um, I hope I'm mistaken, but, um, you know, in, in the way you're forming your question that, uh, you know, the certain radical acts uh, committed by anarchists, right, uh, was provoking oppression and therefore the following population. Am I correct or not? No, no, no okay. that's, that's not what I was saying. Yeah, because, I, 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 because you know, the thing is that um, let's not confuse the whole anarchist movement with anarcho-terrorism. That's something very, very different. Also, don't forget that any terrorist act uh, all this is used and abused by both sides, right, as a propeller to extremism. And I mean extremism not just from the political group, but from the government, most of all. Therefore, a lot of such terrorist acts in the history, in past, present, and I'm sure in the future, are actually a provocation, or if they're not provocation, just accidents, they played that or this way. And anarchists were always kind of like caught in between, because, uh, you know, in this, in this respect, anarchists like choose <laughs> the first to blame for anything what is happening. Blame on both sides, you know, <laughs> left and right. That just, Can I to just put it mildly. 
I'm going to say that, that there were no explicitly anarchist groups in Russia until 1904, and a lot of them were read explicitly anarchist, according to Averidge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, well. Uh, right, but they were. Switzerland yeah. and uh, U.S. Uh, who were working in, uh, Well, okay, well, let's just say that <clears throat> they really started to grow as a movement during, during the course of like 1903, 1904, it became, it really kind of became a big movement I surrounding the three ways. Nina, okay. use your mic. Use your mic. No, I don't okay. know. But my, my point was simply <laughs> that, my point is that I, I do think that, that it sort of uh, spurred the growth of the anarchist movement as a result. They were led by a lot of Russian, Russian Jews, and I do think that the, the, the pogroms helped, in a sense, that, to answer your question, uh, the growth of, of the anarchist movement. Radicalize, it radicalizes people, right? If your uncle's, your uncle's killed, um, you're going you're gonna to take on a kind of an extreme doctrine. Okay, uh, you know, Paul Alvarez writes about three waves of anarchism movement in Russia. 1880s, which is uh, directly related with what was called Narodavolce, right? Populists. Uh, Krapotkin Bakunin, uh, who, you know, were meeting with, uh, you know, French uh, anarchists at the time, and et cetera, et cetera, it was all brought to Russia. Then, uh, you know, um, after the uh, assassinations of you know Tsars and etc cetera, etc cetera, the anarchist movement was, would be kept on the lead would kind of migrate to immigration etc cetera, etc cetera, but continued to exist and there would be the next wave it was right uh, you know as mark said he's absolutely correct right around the you know 1905 revolution kind of like the pre uh, in weight uh, preliminary to 1905 revolution, and they actually very much connected to cultural movements and uh, intelligence and uh, particular symbolism such as mystical anarchists, etc., etc. After that, again, banned till 1917. But you know, it, it never stopped, and the influence actually of the of the anarchist philosophy and theory, you not know, just you know small tactics of political groups of killing here and there. I mean, killing is not the purpose of anarchism. The purpose of anarchism is freedom and creativity. Um, if I can just add a couple words, because uh, a couple people asked me about this point too, about the connection between Jewish anarchism and Jewish terrorism. I, I wouldn't go so far away to separate them as different things. I think um, violent terrorism is part of the history of anarchism, among many other things. For most of anarchism's history and most of its existence, it has not been violent, but we shouldn't necessarily eschew the parts that have been violent. <coughs> there have been uh, anarchist Jewish terrorists in the US. They were just all very bad terrorists. <laughs> um, so uh, for instance, uh, Alexander Berkman shoots Henry Clay Frick and stabs him, does not kill him, ends up in prison. He later, um, Emma Goldman you know, writes a very sad letter after Alex Berkman uh, dies. Uh, because he'd been dying of cancer in France, and he um, tried to shoot himself, and he missed again. And uh, he... closer to the mic. Sorry. Closer. Oh, sorry. And uh, and so and then he he died very slowly and painfully. There were other um, Selig Feinstein. I'm not going to remember the names, and the names aren't so important. But there are a couple um, anarchist Jews around the turn of the century. It's not clear what their affiliations are, but they. Uh, identified as anarchists who try to throw bombs and kill themselves, or the bombs don't work, or there are bombs that are found, you know. It, so it's difficult to dissociate these things completely. It, it is part of the history. Uh, yeah, they were can you to make kill it short? Okay. As they should. So the pogroms, they also led to the renaissance of uh, modern Hebrew poetry. Uh, Balik, for instance. So here's my question. Uh, you never, n nobody mentioned here. What was the relationship between anarchist and Zionist, both left and right wing? <laughs> Very good question. I don't know the answer. I want to hear that. There is uh, still a lot to be done there. There are some people working on this. Um, so. There are several answers that I'll give in brief because I don't want to take up too, too, too much time. Um, there are lots of anarchists. Few anarchists die as anarchists. Um, they often end up evolving into some other form of movement, some other type of uh, person. So uh, there are, after Kishinev, after 1905, after 1917, after other events, anarchists that become Zionists. 
uh, sometimes they go back too. It's, they have complicated histories. Um, and they bring a lot of real radicalism into the history of Zionism. Uh, a lot of people kind of forget the history of, of radicalism that has gone into the history of Zionism because it's, it's quite erased today, but uh, anarchism has a real component there, at least an influence. And then there are people like Abba Gordon uh, writing uh, in Israel and, and other people, he's, he's the most famous, who are trying these weird synthesis between anarchism uh, and Zionism. It might be so unrecognizable that it's hard to call it Zionism in the way that we think of Zionism today, but it is there, it was attempted, uh, and it has a similar history to the connections between anarchism and, and Judaism. Um, and that sort of it begins as a total retaliation against each other, but then there are some sort of cohesive things that form. But the, I, I wouldn't say they're hugely influential. They were never the mainstream. Uh, but I think other people will talk about this. So, yeah. Thank you so much. What a lively, interesting panel.